Okay, so this is the video for part three of module three. And the learning objectives are three, five, three, six, and three, seven to apply appropriate techniques for handling missing and incomplete data, um, to talk about the relevancy of data content and to identify flags of bad data. So the issue of completion um, refers to both missing and incomplete data. And so we need to learn how to apply appropriate techniques for handling missing and incomplete data. Completeness, of course, refers to the data being complete as opposed to missing. Um, I kind of group missing and incomplete together because incomplete data really still is missing data. So there's not like a lot of difference. Um, so the two violations of complete men are missing and incomplete. But like I said, to me, they're sort of one and the same. Um, what exactly is missing data? It's not such a simple answer. Missing data refers to the absence or lack of information in a data set. Um, it occurs when certain observations or values are not recorded. This can be for various reasons such as data entry errors, survey non-responses, equipment malfunctions, or simply because certain information was not collected. Um, missing data can either be left blank or um, especially in the old days, I don't know how often this is done anymore, but there were a lot of uses of filler values because um, in some cases, like to get around data validation, which sort of defeated the purpose, you would enter a number to sort of fill with, instead of leaving something em empty, you would fill it. Um, so common filler values would be to put zeros in and not applicables and NAs and nuns and all kinds of other weird little characters. Um, so essentially filler values kind of mess things up more than they help, <laughs> um, especially if the data ended up being analyzed by someone who didn't know what the fillers were. Um, I remember this happening many, many times when I analyzed data in my younger years. Um, filling things in with zero is generally a very bad idea um, unless it's a specific context like we looked at in the earlier video. Um, people eating meat number of times per week. If they filled an NA, it probably means they didn't eat meat, which is a zero. So that would be a valid thing to fill in, but be really careful about filling in missing values um, with anything else. Okay. So the filler values can be meaningful or they can actually mean something. So for example, if the data column is the number of pets and the response is NA, that most likely means a person doesn't have a pet, so that could actually be filled in as a zero. But in some cases, it's not clear what exactly that is. Okay. Types of missing data, you can, there is such a thing as missing this patterns. What does this mean? Um, essentially, it means that you would expect the data that's missing is kind of missing at random. But non-random missing data can be something like maybe the computer was down that day and so there's no data from a certain date. Um, it could also be nefarious issues and that somebody deleted all the data for a week because maybe there were bad sales and they didn't want them in the sales report. So missing data is kind of a sensitive issue in terms of like, well, why is it missing? Um, okay. You can also have missing data in two ways. You can have missing data in terms of like everything else in that row is filled in, but a particular value is not filled in. Like the number of pets would be blank for somebody that doesn't have a pet. Um, but you can also have entire rows of data missing, which is another missing data issue. And so what does that mean? Um, if you have a class of 30 students, there should be 30 rows of data, not 29. You should not have a month of sales data missing. So these things happen, people. Okay. So how do you detect missing data? And exploratory data analysis looking at, you know, minimum values, maximum values. If your minimum is like a dot or just missing altogether. A lot of software like R, there's a lot of packages that will tell you like how many values are missing in a field. Frequency tables are always super helpful. Most frequency tables will have like the number blank or missing um, on it. There are programming functions like is null and R that you can actually um, check to see if the data is missing. And it's super handy if you can do a missing data report, which like some of the R packages that do profiling um, did that, that we looked at in mod one. 
but not every function, I mean, not every package will be able to do that. Okay. Be careful about using a pivot table though for frequency because um, you can run a pivot table and not be able to detect that there's missing values. Okay. Another big huge problem with missing data is that if you did, for example, um, if you added up the ages here, um, you get the average of the four ages for which there's data, but you have no idea what the missing age is. So when you do something like that, is the value accurate or not? And the answer is you really have no idea um, whether or not it is. So you have to be careful about analyzing aggregate data when there's missing fields. Um, okay. A better approach would be to filter out missing values and aggregate and note that there's one, you know, four students and one missing. That would be a better approach. How do you handle missing data? And the answer is, um, it depends. That's the answer to a lot of things in data cleaning. So you have to look at the context and how to deal with them. And often you want to bring up like subject matter expertise, um, possibly call somebody in if they know something about where the data came from and what's going on. You can mathematically handle missing data. And there's a whole bunch of sort of statistical background on things like this. Imputation means essentially you estimate missing values based on existing data. Now, for example, if you have data that's all sales data from the month of April and there's like a couple lines missing what month the sales data from, but you know it's all from April in, you can fill it in with April. Um, but you're not often that lucky, but there are a lot of cases where like you know what the value should be and you can fill it in. That's legit if you're like totally certain of it. Um, another way of handling this is to delete incomplete cases, but again, I mean, if you're really picky as an analyst and you start deleting things, you might end up with like no data left to analyze. Um, so in many cases, you have to be careful. It won't, you know, there are some cases where it's not going to be that much of a problem to have a couple of variables missing from a record. Um, there are also statistical methods, sort of like regression methods, that can sort of fill in missing values by using um, a model to sort of predict what the value should be. We're not going to get into that, but um, it's really just, there's a lot of sort of, they're not super sophisticated. They just use statistics and sort of predict what the value should be, and then you can use those. Um, so imputation is the process of putting in values for missing data, which occasionally makes a lot of sense. If you have a city in a zip code, then you know what state it is. You can put that in. Um, if a student is in grade 9, you most likely can assume that they're 14 or 15 years old. You can put that in, and you're not going to be super off. You might want to denote somehow that that was imputed. Typically, you would. Um, but a lot of imputation methods exist. So imputation basically means you're filling in the missing values um, in a way that's educated and not just random. Incomplete data, I consider sort of missing data. Um, incomplete data is when the data is partially filled in. Typically, you know, you fill out part of an address and you leave off the zip code. A lot of times you can get that from somewhere. Um, you might have to match cities and states to zip codes and a table to fill things in. And yes, you may have to spend a lot of time doing something like this to make your data useful. Um, often it might be easier to just impute values. Um, and for the most part, incomplete and missing data are treated exactly the same way. Relevancy of data, which is our last of the six pillars of clean data. Data should be consistent, accurate, valid, unique, complete, and relevant. Relevance means that um, it's, it's useful. So in other words, you shouldn't have a bunch of unnecessary information in your data set. Um, another thing is the timeliness of the data. Once again, the issue of time. Old data is not relevant, people. Um, for most things, stale old data is not worth analyzing. You should get fresher data if you can. Um, other things that are irrelevant are um, fill-in values and error values and fields that don't mean anything. And this glorious word that I call CRUD, which essentially means that there's just stuff in the field. Um, like various spacing issues and straight characters and just random things that should be cleaned out. Okay. In the old days, there were often a lot of these sort of, this is kind of similar to, to um, filling in missings, but filling in error values. Um, if the, somebody thought it was a great idea to enter 999999, 
Um, can you imagine if you're doing like calculations and that actually ends up in the calculation for an average or something? It's going to sort of mess everything up. Um, CRUD is my fancy name for just any kind of stray marks or whatnot, which happens a lot. Um, an example of stray characters would be like spaces before the words that you want, random typos, um, random stray signs, signatures, and just stuff in the data, which you'll see a lot of. Um, fixing um, the stuff is really not, sometimes it's not too, too hard. Excel actually knows a lot about how to fix CRUD. And so um, there's some functions in Excel, one of which is trim. Um, and trim will actually just get rid of all of the excess spaces that are in there. Um, the other thing is that um, when you're cleaning data, there may be a whole bunch of fields that you're not going to use. So think about whether or not it's even worth it to clean those. I mean, save them as part of the original data, but there might be a whole bunch of sort of just nonsense fields. Typically, when I analyze stuff, I would extract out an analytical file, which included the fields that I wanted. And the other stuff I would leave in the original data, but I wouldn't carry it over and like keep working with it because it was just sort of like random fields of stuff that wasn't really stuff that I was actually going to analyze. The other thing, of course, is if the data is too old, don't use it. Is it just some fields that are too old or is it the entire data set? Um, it's often ignored, but it shouldn't be. And so there's another exercise that's on Canvas for you, which is the exercise of completion and relevance. Okay. We are going to continue and talk about a few other things. There are no ex exercises on these, but I wanted to talk in general about what I call flags of bad, bad data. Um, Data that should not be analyzed is data that has ethical issues or bias issues or other major problems. Like if your data is garbage, it's not worth analyzing. Um, ethical issues, obviously still stolen data, but bias issues as well. I mean, if you have data that is just, it's supposed to be a representative sample and it's just like, you know, everybody in there is like 85 years old, um, that's not a representative sample of like age. So. I have to think about like what data you have and if it has serious flaws and if it does, um, don't bother analyzing it. So some flags of this, um, suspicious missing values is another problem. Suppose you have 10 years of data and there's a missing year. Oops, um, there's something wrong with the data. A lot of filler data, filler values can be problematic. If you have a bunch of data that's filled in with like these 99999s, what are you going to do? Um, possibly data that only has certain seasons, like sales from October to December, like before Christmas, and then they don't give you the sales data from January to March. Well, you can't really analyze a time trend on that, um, at least not for other than the time period that you have. Um, a lot of duplicates. This may result from a bad join. Again, when you join, we haven't learned much about joins here yet, but we will. But when you join data, it's entirely possible that what you do when you're joining is you accidentally create a bunch of duplicates. Um, this actually may be something that's fixable, but too many duplicates will result in double counting and triple counting things and just a big mess. Um, another issue is trun truncated data. This, um, to people that are relatively young, probably isn't seen as much of a problem as it used to be, but I don't know the exact time frame when this ended. I'm certainly old and, and I remember these things. Um, apparently, the old Apple spreadsheets only had 255 columns as a limit, which might sound wonderful, but if you actually had 500 columns of data, that meant that um, half your data was basically lost. Similarly, Excel used to have 65,536 rows, which might sound very generous, but actually most big data sets today have bigger um, numbers of rows than that. So what would happen is if your data exceeded this number of rows, it was simply cut off. And you may still have data um, that was copied, carried over from the old days, and it may be truncated. So that's another problem to think about. And truncation might actually explain something like um, having only three months of data instead of six when you're supposed to. Maybe that, that time frame was what was truncated, particularly if it's older data. Um, the newer, um, I think at least the last 10 years, but I mean, to me 10 years isn't that long. Um, now it's not as much of a problem, but I, I, don't, I still don't know if Excel actually has an infinite number of rows as a limit. That's a good question. Okay. Um, Another flag for beta, for bad data is if there's gross inconsistencies. Um, so if you have um, an aggregated version of the same data, you're studying a population and it says that there's a sample size of 500, and then you also have the unaggregated granular data and there's 750 people, what happened? 
um, where the 250 people that aren't representing the aggregated data. So if you have like inconsistencies from um, what should be the same, same sample and a couple different data sheets, what's going on, there may be something weird going on there. Um, data differs from some standard. Um, for example, a random sample that's 80% male, um, the population is not 80% male, it's about 50% male. So you may have some type of problem with that racially or um, age-wise or gender-wise or whatever other reason. Um, bias data is a big problem, result of non-random sampling, perhaps the biggest and hugest unaddressed issue in data analytics. Um, yeah. Another flag for ba bad data is that the data has been edited. I mean... If, you, if you're working on data, it really shouldn't be, I mean, granted, I just told you to clean data and like fill in um, MP missings and stuff occasionally, but you shouldn't have a lot of manipulated fields. You shouldn't have stuff that looks like it's been edited a lot in the data, um, particularly if it's supposed to be raw data and it's not supposed to be having been worked on. Um, and if it was worked on, there should be a log of what was done to it. Okay. And the opposite end is um, data that's too perfect. So if you have data that seems like it's, you know, somebody weighs, somebody's weight is recorded to the ninth decimal place, that's not something people would usually do. Um, I played with ChatGPT and tried to get it to um, do some time series. It had no variability, um, meaning that it would do like 5, 10, 15. It would not do like um, sort of like random times. Um, so data that has no variability, um, all natural data has variability. So um, you should not have data that's like so perfect, you know, like the weather pattern. It's like 50 degrees, 55 degrees, 60 degrees, 50, 55, 60. It shouldn't be like that. Um, it should be kind of scattered all over the place with natural variability. Data that's too good to be true, right? The exact known number of stardust par particles in Mars atmosphere, I made that up, but I mean, Nobody actually knows that, so how could that be in the data? Okay. Ethically, um, data, like the ethics and laws are still sort of murky, but, you know, um, anything that doesn't comply with research protocols or privacy laws or ethical principles, like if you have a bunch of like medical data that you don't think was legally obtained, like how did you actually get this data, you know? Um, medical data should always be de-identified. It shouldn't have like patient names and birth dates in it um, together. So if you have data like that, you should be a little cautious as to like where did this come from. Um, and so we will end this module with a um, case study of data cleaning that is set up for you on Canvas that involves a larger data set in Excel and some directions as to what to do with it and sort of like a real life simulation of data cleaning. And that concludes Module 3 and Data Cleaning. Thank you.